probably won't be using the mic stand anyway. All right, praise the Lord. Did you get set up there, James? Mm -hmm. All right, praise the Lord. We, we're still studying out of the book of 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter 21. And uh, wonderful studies that we've been studying. Uh, last week we seen in chapter 21 that uh, David had, had fled to uh, at the priest at a place called Nob, and uh, there was a it was a Himalek. The priest was there, and uh, David asking for some bread. Right? We talked about what common bread was. Now I want to I want to go start there in verse six, chapter twenty one, verse six. It says, "So the priest gave him the hallow bread, for, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord." to put hot bread in the day when the spies had taken it, it had been taken away. Now, do y'all remember anything in the New Testament that Jesus taught on when it comes to this bread? Let me give you some scriptures. I don't think we need to necessarily look them up. We can. New Testament scriptures, Matthew 12, 1 through 8, and Mark 2, 23 through 28. And Luke 6, 1 through 5. Since it's, this happens in all three of the Gospels, I, or, or there's four Gospels, but it, it, it's, it's, it's repeated in three of them, it must be really important, right? Right. So what does it say about how Jesus applied this happening in the Old Testament to things that were happening with his disciples? You'll have to read the Scripture. Yeah, well, actually, it was talking about the, uh, in the New Testament, uh, Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Oh, Matthew 12. Yeah, Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Yeah, the question I had is, what was Jesus teaching? He, he, he quoted the Old Testament here, and he was using it as an example to teach with. And I'm, I'm sure we do that too. Some of the, the people that are, are teachers, they'll use Old Testament to, to help you with New Testament, or they'll use Old Testament to help you with your life, you know? So what is it? What did Jesus teach? We should have read it out loud. I know we should have. Uh, what it is is that the, the, the disciples were uh, in, a, in a wheat field. And uh, they were hungry on Sabbath day. Right? right. Mm -hmm. So they went and they got some uh, of the, of the uh, wheat that had fallen on the ground. And they picked it up and they began eating it. And the, the Pharisees came against him, saying that they shouldn't be working on the Sabbath day. So has anybody got a scripture there that's what Jesus said? I wish I had written it down. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees after... after uh, Stop. Let me get there. Do you know, Brother Starnes, what he said to the, to the, to the Pharisees? <laughs> I have the gist of it. Okay, so tell us. The gist of it is it doesn't matter what goes in that comes, that's whether it's clean or not, it's what comes out. You know. Okay, that, that was that's part of it. But really what I was looking for was about the Sabbath day. He said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? He says it's not against the law to to eat on on the Sabbath. Right. Right? Uh, it's against to to, to labor in lieu of of what God tells you to do on the Sabbath day. You know, Brother Keith, I, I recall in the earlier days, uh, the women folks would uh, prepare their food and everything during the day ahead before even Sunday. They didn't cook on Sunday. Right, right. They had already prepared. Exactly. And, but, you know, we can, we can become too religious because, you know, every day in a Christian's life should be a Sabbath day. I've had to work on Saturday, Sundays before. Uh, I don't like it, and, and the fact is, one time I felt really bad about it. The Lord told me, well, if you feel so bad about it, you know, I gave you this job. Why are you saying that what I gave you is not no good? And it, sure enough, as I prayed, uh, God changed it, and I went to days, you know. But God had to put me through that trial to realize that every day is the Sabbath day. So right. don't, don't beat yourself up is what I'm saying if you have to work on Sunday. When yeah. I worked at the police department, I had to work on Sunday. 
one of my most memorable experiences was the Sunday that was Christmas Day. When I was at work, a family brought homemade cookies to us on their way to church. Amen. Oh, yeah. That was sweet. Yes. But yes. you know, it says the Sabbath day was made for man. Well, that means a day of rest. Men are supposed to work six days a week and have a day of rest. Right. I think you should set aside some time of resting, but not just for your body, but for your meditation of your spirit. I like the fact that we can get together as a body of Christ on a Sunday, you know. And that's the thing a lot of people don't understand that don't go to church that say they're Christians. They miss out so much on the fellowship of other believers. Okay, let me go to the next verse. Chapter 21, verse 7. In my outline it says, Saul has spies. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Dueg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belongeth to Saul. And as I read this, this was very interesting because all of a sudden they're talking about the priest and they're talking about what, what David's doing. And then, then the, the writer of the story shows you a man who's there to the sideline. Right. He's just there, observing. He was delayed because uh, they would have to wait back then when, when, you, when, you, when you had sacrifices. Since he was an Edomite, he was not an Israelite. So the Israelites would be served first by the priest. And if you wanted to be served by the priest for your sins, you had to wait. And so he was waiting there, following. He was a servant of Saul. His name was Dueg, and the word Dueg means anxious. He was an anxious type person. And uh, an Edomite is a descendant of Esau. And if you're familiar with Jacob and Esau, Jacob stole Esau's birthright. So therefore the Edomites already hate anybody who's descended from Jacob. Yes. Stole? I don't know. He gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think this hairy red man was uh, very stupid, but that's what he saw. You know, for yeah. when, when I studied that, I, I didn't have the respect for him that I had with Saul. You know, when I first started reading about Saul, Saul got filled with the Holy Ghost. This guy, Esau, we're not going to get off subject. Well, we're not. It's right here. Right. This guy, Dueg, is a descendant of a, of a, a barbarian. A barbarian is what he is. He okay. cut with his flesh first before anything else. Yes, that's exactly right. Now, he was the chief. This guy, Dueg, was the chief herdsmen over all the herds and, and, and the servants of Saul. Okay, so let's keep reading verse 8. And David said unto Ahimelech, Is there not here under thine hand a sword or spear? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth, Behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is none other save that here. And David said, there is none other like that. And give it to me. Okay. Now, uh, it's interesting that David needed a sword. Do you think perhaps that he realized that Dueg was there and that he might have needed to look over his back because somebody might try to kill him? You know? Uh, he said he was uh, 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 about the king's business. That word business there is the bar, and the bar means a work, okay? And when we talk about the works of God, the bar of God, uh, but this he says he's about the works of the king. Now remember back when, when Saul, when, when David killed the giant, remember he took his sword and his armor and he took it back to the temple. Remember we read that. And here it remains there. They had put it, they had put it in a safe place to keep it. And uh, the one of the things that was interesting about the sword, the reason, why would they keep a sword in a temple? Any sword. Might have been the same reason. Some of the facts of the day keep a <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. But I don't think that was the case in this one. What do you think? On this one, what I feel, I mean, this is just me 101, is that, you know what, this is something that, that the Lord really... Delivered. I mean, the Lord delivered this, and it was a mighty work that He did. And it's like, how? I mean, to remember what the Lord is doing, and to remember Him as a commemorative. I mean, right. 
That's I think it was a memorial to them because it was wrapped in the ephod. Now, an ephod yes. is a white linen garment that only the priests wear. So they had wholly sanctified the sword and, 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 you know, and said that this, this is something to be revered. Of course, David, being the true king, was given back this article right, at this time. Now, this was a very bad thing we're going to find out in the future. But let's keep reading and because uh, this is a long story. But uh, it's very interesting. Verse 10. David flees to Gath. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Ahish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Ahish said unto him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did not they sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Ahish, the king of Gath. Now, uh, Achish was a Philistine king, a mortal enemy of Saul. And David went to Gath trying, the word Gath means wine press, uh, but he went to Gath and he tried to hide among the masses, kind of just kind of mingle in with these Philistines. But guess what? All of a sudden he's a rock star. <laughs> they know who he is and they know the songs being sung about him. Right? I mean, it's true. This is, he, he, got, he got rock star uh, uh, you know, yes. status here. And he realizes that the word had gotten around. And he also realizes that Saul's jealousy has also gotten around. And uh, now, the, now, now it comes up to where David's getting a little afraid. He gets afraid right. of this king because he's in the enemy's camp. Right? Verse 13 says, He went to the enemy's camp. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrambled on the doors, scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard and said, Akish, unto the servants, Lo, you see this man is mad. Wherefore have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that he have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? And shall this fellow come into my house? All right. Okay, so David becomes a madman. The word mad there is halal, where we get our word hallelujah. He began going hallelujah, hall you know, hallelujah, acting like a madman. Using the word hall halal, the word halal there means to show, to boast foolishly, to rave, to celebrate and praise. It also means to feign madness, okay? So, no wonder some of the Baptists thought y'all Pentecostal people were crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because halal, that's what we do. We that's halal. Right. We, we do. We get wild. I don't care. God deserves that kind of praise. Now, in this instance, though, he was using it for a different thing. It says here he scrabbled on the wall. That means he scratched marks on the, on the gates of, the, of, of their city. He was marring their gates. Uh... He was acting similar to someone who had an epileptic fit. He was drooling down in his beard. Right. And let me tell you something. Arabics, it is an abomination. It's intolerable uh, insult to spit on, um, on your beard. But when a man spits on another man's face, that's, that's grounds for beheading in the Middle East. You know what I'm saying? It's so intolerable. It's a, and it, maybe when you do it to yourself, it's, it's, it's considered intolerable. Uh, and he, uh, in verse 14, we see uh, the king there, uh, Akish. He says, Lo, which is uh, in Hebrew, Ra, Ra. See, behold, this man is mad. And the word there is Shaga. Shaga means insane. Right. This man's insane. And he goes, Why do you bring him to me? And also, he says, Why did you bring him here to be part of my household? He's being very sarcastic. You want him to be my son? You know what I'm saying? You want this madman? And also one of the things I want to point out is that insanity in old tribes, and it was in the, it, with, with, the, with them that, that day and also in the Indian tribes of America, if you were insane, you were, it was attributed to a spirit. Yes. That you were, you were possessed by either a demonic spirit or a holy spirit. Okay. Yeah, we, need to, we need to remember that today. Yes, we do. And there is two types of possession. You're either possessed by the Holy Spirit 
that you're possessed by some other spirit. That's it. You know, but David, here he is. I know he's filled with God, and I'm sure God led him to do this, but I still see a little bit of treachery in David. That, he, that as he gets older and older, he realizes some of the things I do when I'm young, would, would there be a different way other than lying? Mm -hmm. I mean, because this is lying too. I mean, I, I, I've been listening to uh, The Adventures of Superman <laughs> from 1939 through 52, reading a program. And I found out Superman's the biggest liar in the world. <laughs> but he has a secret identity. And he, he lies saying that, no, that, that wasn't Superman. That wasn't me, you know, Clark Kent. That was Superman. You know, I'm not Superman. And I found out it's weird how, even though it's a children's thing, and maybe, well, I'm a, chill, I'm a big kid, I guess. Right. But uh, I, I didn't notice it when I was a kid that Superman was lying. I just noticed it recently. I didn't realize that David was lying until recently. I it's guess it's subtle. It's subtle lies. It's the subtle lies that will get a Christian in trouble. And it's gotten David in trouble already here. Okay. Well, I'm hoping I get to this next part. All right. I have gotten to the next part, and we'll read it. Uh, now we're starting lesson 13, chapter 22, starting with verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Undulon. When, when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there thither to him, and everyone that was distressed and distressed, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, gave themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about four hundred men. Wow. Okay, so David sneaks away, says he escaped, and that word escaped here in Hebrew is malat, and it means smooth and slippery. So he slipped away, right? And he hides in a cave, and uh, and the word got to his family. Uh, now, what, where he had went was a place of uh, where, where there was a number of pits and underground vaults. Uh, some were square, and some were about fifteen to twenty feet deep, deep, with perpendicular sides, about uh, fifteen to twenty feet deep. And it was in limestone. Now, I'm talking about a place that's in the Middle East. This, this is where he went to hide, okay? Mm -hmm. They know where this place is, Adullam. And uh, it's a limestone pits, basically, in the mountains. Uh, it was six miles southwest of Bethlehem. Now, I noticed something, though. David went to this cave, and 400 men sought his help. Right. And I noticed something very peculiar about verse 22 and I made y'all, I made a, a, a list of it. Mm -hmm. David is a, is a type of Holy Spirit comforter. He's a type of Christ. Okay? He went to a place of safety and that's where we have to go. Amen. And I want to share with you the three terrible deeds or the three deadly deeds. Right? Mentioned in 1 Samuel 22 2. And this is new revelation. I did not get this out of a commentary. Okay. Everyone that is in distress, that's the first D. Uh -huh. The second one is discontentment. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the third one is, is uh, oh, I, I distress, debt, and discontentment. They're different. Let's read this. In Hebrew, the word for distress is masak, as it shows there. And in the King James Version, it's, it's translated four times as straightness. One time is distress, one time is anguish. Six times it's mentioned in the Old Testament. It means a narrow place, a place of confinement, anguish, and distress. Okay, In the English dictionary, I looked it up, distress means a great pain, anxiety, sorrow, acute physical or mental sufferings, affliction, trouble, and a state of extreme necessity of misfortune. How many Christians are distressed? Okay, let's look up some scriptures. Uh, my scriptures I have mentioned here. I'm probably not going to get to the second part of this, but let's go through these. Y'all are going to have to look them up for me. I've already looked them up once. So it's time. Oh, I've looked them up several times, actually. First scripture, Genesis 35, 3. Let us arise and go. Read that one for me. Somebody read Genesis 35, 3.
Isn't that, isn't that great? Arise and go and make an altar. If you're in distress, arise. It doesn't say sit down. No. It says arise and go and build an altar to the Lord. Okay, let's look up uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 7. Which in my we, distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried to God to help, for help. He heard me from His sanctuary. My cry reached His ears. Amen. And that's also written in Psalms 18.6. So uh, it's, it's exactly the same. And you know who wrote that? David himself. Psalms 4.1. He has enlarged me. Who's got that? Psalms 4.1. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Enlarge me. What does that mean to be enlarged by God? Lifted up. Lifted up? Yeah, lifted him up. Or, or you know. Well, let, let, me, let me put it down. Uh, you're having problems with work, so am I. Right now, all my bosses quit, and I'm doing the job that the bosses are done. <laughs> We're doing the same job. I mean, yeah. yeah, and I'm doing three people's job now. And guess what? I was so, I didn't, I didn't want the job, still, had, still don't want it, but uh, I'm, uh, one of the guys at work, one of the executives at work says, no, you're not yet you're not the administrator, you know. Because uh, I'm a supervisor, I'm not, a, you know, admin, whatever, FM. But nonetheless, guess what you have to do? You have to enlarge your coast, your borders of what you, of what your sphere is. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, here we have a sphere of influence ah. right here, and we're, and I'm only influencing these many people, right. and however many people that we can get to listen to them on YouTube, which is not very many. I wish it was, but. Right now, the sphere of influence is right here. Right. Well, God wants to enlarge our sphere of influence outside of our normal, you know? And God wants to do that, but the thing about it is the devil wants to put something called distress on you Amen. that might keep you from being confident enough to go ahead and step outside that one little sphere. Yes. Let me tell you about a dream I had. And this is a very... I have lots of dreams and most of them don't mean anything because I read a lot of books about war and a lot of Bible. And I'll have, I'll have uh, things in my head when I go to sleep. But then sometimes God gives you visions. Amen. And I got a vision last week and I've shared this with several people. It's very interesting. I was in a very, very dark, dark place like a cave. And anybody who's ever really truly been in a cave you know you cannot see where you're stepping. You're right. You cannot see where you're going. If there's no light in a cave, no, no source of light, you won't, you'll be completely dark. And this is how I felt. And I was very scared. But the Lord was prompting me in my dream to step forward and start walking. Amen. And I was very afraid and I felt myself shaking. And I, 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 I reached out to step. And as I stepped, a stone illuminated in front of my foot. And as I stepped harder, uh, the, the Word of God began to be infused in that stone in Hebrew. Okay? And I stepped on that step. And then and, and the Word of God told me that this is where I want you to do. Step forward. I stepped another step. And every time I stepped, a stone would illuminate. And, and the Word of God would illuminate on that stone. And I was so afraid. I was so afraid. But, but the thing about it is, is that everywhere I stepped, the Word of God was leading me and guiding me right through the darkness, right through the piercing, right through the very dark, dark, dark. And everywhere I stepped, light showed up. Amen. And that's where we're going to be at. We're in a dark place. The Lord spoke to me about it. Every one of us is in a very, very dark place in this world. And everywhere we step, we should have the Word of God illuminated before us in our steps and in our path. Okay. I'm glad I shared that. I'm glad I came here. I got a few more minutes. Let's finish. Let's finish this meditation on distress. And since y'all got your copies, bring them back next week because we'll finish the other two D's because we're we're, we're going to run out of time on this one. Okay, he enlarged me. Ver Psalms 118 verse five. He set me in a large place. Right. Right. And if y'all want to look that one up, you can. Um, Psalms 120 verse one says, "In my distress, I cried to him, and he heard me." You'll notice that it says in verse uh, Psalms 18.6, 
in Psalms, uh, in First Second Samuel twenty seven, it says, "In my distress I called," but this one has says, "In my distress I cried." You know, and I think there's a difference between just calling out to God and crying out to God. In, in Psalms twenty five, in Isaiah twenty five verse four, it says that He is a refuge from the storm. I think we should look that one up. Let's look up Isaiah. 25 verse 4. We're going to look up these last two and I'll close. Wonderful scriptures to take with you. For thy has been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy and his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible one is as a storm against the wall. Amen. He is our refuge from the storm. And then let's look up. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Who shall separate from the love of Christ? No one. Nothing. Distress will not separate us from the love of Christ because we have a comforter in whom we can call. Amen. There it is right there. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Amen. Well, we're going to close there next week. We're going to we're going to we're going to start with the second of the three D's. And I hope y'all don't mind me jumping off on these rabbit trails. But as the Lord speaks to me, I'm just got to write it down. You know.